Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring music, education, technology, and the intersections between them with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. Thanks to my sponsor this week, Scale Exercise Play Along Tracks. Hey, it's me, Robbie Burns, and I'm checking in for another solo episode. Today, I'm going to talk about what's on my desk. This is based on a blog post I wrote earlier this year and which I mentioned in the previous episode of this show. I thought it would be fun to take a moment and talk about the hardware that is on my desk. There will be a little bit of discussion about software today. For me, I have invested in a lot of the hardware that I use to do my work and have done a lot of research that set me up to be in a fairly comfortable space. And that I think about this in terms of my instruments and my sticks and mallets and percussion accessories and also my technology that's on my desk. And I think about this often because for me, I'm not really a gearhead. I, as much as I do love what technology can do for me, I don't delight in having like every single gadget um, or owning every single instrument accessory. In fact, I kind of tune out a lot of advancements in hardware because I'm, to be honest, pretty satisfied with my current setup. But of course, I realized that for many, hardware is an area that's kind of like a holdup for them when it comes to being more techno technologically savvy. Uh, and sometimes it helps to kind of break down the different things in a setup and how they all contribute to a workflow, and in this case, my workflow. I'm going to talk about my home studio desk, which is in my percussion private teaching studio, where I play, where I teach privately. But I'm also going to talk a little bit about the many desks I use at Ellicott Mills Middle School, where I teach, because we have a music team of four, and we're doing quite a bit of room rotating. And there's definitely some consideration that has gone into making our computing experience be consistent no matter which desk we're teaching from. Okay, let's talk a little bit about my desk. Now, I'm sitting here right now recording this very episode in my private teaching studio, which is also my practice space. I'm in the, you know, this is the basement of my house, and it's full of percussion instruments. But in the corner of the room is a studio desk with a handful of tiers. And this is the kind of desk that is designed for doing music producing. So it's got like a main area where you could put like a MIDI keyboard or some peripherals related to music making. And then it has a tier above that where you would put a computer monitor, um, some studio monitors, like kind of enable to maximize the amount of space, but also leave lots of room for, for instruments that are at a comfortable height for playing into frequently. And then it's got a little slide out area for my Bluetooth computer keyboard and mouse and trackpad. The little slide out tray is actually, if I'm sitting comfortably at this desk because I'm tall, it kind of bumps against my knees. So what I have found is that it's actually, I put my little tiny MIDI keyboard on that tray since I use it less frequently than my keyboard, mouse, and trackpad. And then that seems to be the right balance. More on that keyboard in a moment. So on the different tiers of this desk, which by the way, I will link this desk or the closest thing I can find to it into the show notes of this episode. Okay, so let's talk about what actually is on the desk. On the top tier of the desk, I've got my MacBook. This is the core, it's the brain of my computing life. All of my devices I consider to be windows into the same information and similar workflows, but the MacBook, because it runs creative professional software like Ableton Live and Logic Pro, uh, and because my workflows are just a little bit quicker and more automated on the Mac, it tends to be the thing I default to when I'm gonna be working for long lengths of time on any kind of you know task. Now, this thing is super powerful. I ended up going for the 14-inch M1 chip. I got the, the Max chip. So it's, it's a computer that is like way more powerful than I need. Just to, to give you an idea of this computer, I typically have like 14 to 20 apps running simultaneously on this thing. And usually one or two or more of them are Creative Pro apps. Things like Dorico, Ableton Live, stuff that is using the multiple cores of the processor. And I, I gotta tell you, this thing does have a fan in it, and I have not once heard the fan turn on. I've had this machine almost a year. So like, I'm, I'm starting to believe I probably could have gotten away with even the MacBook Air. But that's you know besides the point. I know that by getting a nicer chip, I future-proofed this machine. I'm gonna have it for hopefully at least five years. And it's gonna, it's, it's doing awesome. It's like really just the best Mac that I've ever owned. I know that seems inevitable or obvious because it is the newest and computers only get better. 
But, you know, I've had a couple of Macs that, as much as I love Mac OS, have given me some hardware problems. And the, my most recent one, notably needing to have its keyboard replaced three times. So I'm really happy with how rock solid this computer is. It's got lots of ports. It's got an SD card port, an HDMI port, numerous USB-C ports. And it's great. And it's awesome because while I used to be a multi-Mac person, which is to say that I had a laptop and then a Mac mini in my studio, I kind of like this approach. You know, I do have to unplug and plug it into my studio desk every time I'm down here. But the cool thing is that I don't have to like manage the settings of the same apps on multiple Macs. Like I'm not, you know, like on two different Macs, you know, if like I go into, for example, Logic Pro and I say, oh, I want to have the recording function work this way. And I turn, I check on a little checkbox in the settings. I don't have to like duplicate that step twice uh, for both of my Macs. I just have one computer in my life that runs Mac OS and it runs the same Mac OS no matter where I'm sitting because it's the same unit and I plug it in and it's ready to rock. Now what I have it plugged into is I have two Thunderbolt devices that take a Thunderbolt cable and then kind of like split it into numerous USB, USB-C and other kinds of ports. So this is basically a way to take one port of my MacBook and then like plug a bunch of stuff into that one port. And I have two of these docks it's made by 12 South, and I will link the model in the post that I have. I have two of them just because of how many things I currently have plugged into my computer. And then I use the power cable, the MagSafe power cable that came with the laptop. So I basically have three things that I plug into this computer. I mean, if I didn't have as many peripherals, it would just be like one cable that would go into the Mac and give it everything. But that's not how I'm choosing to live my life right now. So that's not the case. So I get power. And then between these two USB Thunderbolt docks, well, you'll, you'll as I go through the things on my desk, you'll hear all the things I have plugged into my computer, but they're powering pretty much the whole, the whole deal. Now, if I move over to the right, this is, by the way, I keep this open because I like the feeling of having two separate screens where I can drag windows around. So I keep the lid of my laptop open to the left. And then to the right, I have an LG ultra wide monitor, which I'm not going to talk about a lot because I really, I don't like it. I, I really need to upgrade it. It's pretty low resolution and small and kind of buggy. And it was just like when I moved here into this space, I just, I needed something and I just went for it. It was like one of the cheapest things I could find on Amazon and I regret it, but it is a secondary monitor. I, anyone who's taught through the pandemic knows the utility of this. So that's kind of what I have going on to the right of my Mac. And then kind of like snuck in between them both and sort of under the lower left corner of the monitor is a Logitech webcam. This is the C920 model that was super popular that you couldn't find anywhere right uh, at the start of March, 2020. I bought it. There's some stuff that had I done more and more months of research, I probably could have got something that was a little bit better suited to my needs. But I think in general, it does the job. It's good. It's 1080p camera. It has decent autofocus. The lighting looks okay. It's MacBooks are not known for having great webcams. So it definitely did its job and continues to do its job as a slightly more flexible and higher resolution camera that I can move around. I have it on a snake arm that's actually like a kind of a cheap $20 thing I bought on Amazon where it's like t like a clamp that clamps onto the back of the desk and then it has two bendable snake arms, one for the camera and then another with a ring light attached to it, which I just have sort of like feeding up through the back area of my monitor and then, you know, I can turn it on as needed. Now, I also have my studio monitors on this level of the tier. I have the M-Audio BX5As. They're not super powerful, but they're more than enough for my needs. They're certainly loud enough that I can have a student practicing drum set along to a recording and, you know, we can hear everything okay and in balance. They could be a little louder for that exact purpose, but I think they're okay. They're a little small. I bought them over a decade ago and they are still holding up. They were on sale because they were red and I guess black is the most popular color for this kind of thing. So I have these kind of accents on my desk, these bright red studio monitors. I think they're cool. I like them. You know, M-Audio that makes good stuff and, and it's hard to, to complain. All right. On the main tier area of my desk, there's quite a bit happening here. I have sort of hidden and tucked away my Thunderbolt docks. And then uh, out of one of them, I have coming a lightning cable, although I need to actually rethink that because I now have a charging 
like a chi charging dock. Uh, a dock is not, I guess a mat is the technical term for this. It is a, a big mat that has room for my phone, my AirPods case, and also my watch. There's like a little thing hanging off the end that the Apple Watch can charge on. And I typically am down here around the time of day that my Apple Watch is dying. I track my sleep on it. So uh, I moved this down here. This was in on my nightstand, and I moved it down here. All right, I've got a little organizing station for paper and things. I pretty much try to just keep one area where paper is, and that's just an inbox. I'm very getting things done methodology down here, so I try to not have any piles of paper on my desk other than things that have not been processed. So I've got a little inbox there. I've got a little area tucked away um, on a little tiny shelf. In between these two tiers is like some external storage devices that I use to store extra video and audio and photos that do not need to be accessed immediately. Okay, back to the main tier of the desk. I've got uh, also coming out from a power strip on the floor, I've got a charger, a USB-C charger, because my iPad Pro 12.9 inch and Magic Keyboard sits kind of to the left, but down on the main tier of the desk. So it's sort of like down and to the left of my MacBook screen. And I keep it plugged in to this cable, the, the keyboard, so that the iPad is always charging. But if I need to like rip it off the keyboard stand and then like stick it on a music stand somewhere else in the studio as sheet music, that's really easy to do. But while I'm down here private teaching, it's just sort of an auxiliary device. I actually, I usually have my camera displays up on it because I let my students in and out of my studio through an automated doorbell and door lock. And I can see the camera on the iPad display and do some unlocking and locking of the door on there. But I also use sheet music on it. I take notes on my students' progress on it as well. It's super easy to just rip off the desk and carry around the studio and have with me anywhere in the room. Now, I also have been using a great feature called universal control lately, which is when I can actually move my mouse cursor off the left side of my MacBook, and then it will bleed into the right edge of the iPad screen and become a control for the iPad cursor. So I can actually use my Apple Magic Mouse, Magic Keyboard, and Magic Trackpad as input for either the Mac or the iPad without fiddling with any settings or without taking my hands off of the place that they are like I just move the mouse cursor to the left edge of the Mac screen and then now it's an iPad cursor very cool I use it all the time now speaking of Apple magic devices those are in fact the three things that I use to control my computer I have the trackpad on the left and I've it took a lot of training and like restructuring of my mind but I'm now really comfortable having the trackpad on the left instead of the right and the reason for this is that on a big monitor where I'm doing lots of like refined editing where I need the precision of the mouse, it's really helpful for me to be able to do the precision cursor movement with the mouse in my right hand while doing like dragging and pinching and zooming stuff with my left hand. So if I'm in a logic project, for example, and I need to move the mouse to a really specific place in the timeline, and then pinch subtly with my left hand to zoom in to that area of the, the music and the project, I become like way faster that I can do like all of this stuff at once. Because for me, like pinch to zoom is essential and it's a huge loss that's something you can't do with a mouse. But I also feel way more comfortable using a mouse. I'm more precise, I'm faster, and my fingers don't get as tired. The Magic Keyboard is great. It feels pretty close to all my other Apple laptop keyboards, so I like the consistency. I think it makes me type faster to have the same keyboard. I'm certainly open to other kinds of keyboards and other mouse-related products, but for now this is working super well for me. Okay, I've also got the Stream Deck on my desk. This is a product from Alago, where it is basically a grid of buttons. I have the medium-sized one. There's also an extra large and a little mini one. And this has a grid, it's a grid of five by three, and what I can do is customize, there's a little screen on each button that I can customize by dragging an image into their app. And then I can customize what the buttons do. And I can have different profiles and presets of buttons based on apps. For example, Notation Central has a profile that when at Dorico is the foreground app, or Sibelius, for example, I use the Dorico profile because that's my notation editor of choice. When that app is in the foreground, the Stream Deck is overtaken by a series of custom buttons that can like do things that in the app, like things that sometimes will take multiple levels of menus deep to accomplish. There's just like buttons that I can tap immediately on my desk. 
that'll do those things. Now, by default, I have kind of like a just a general Stream Deck profile where the top row is able to change the camera input in OBS, Open Broadcasting Software. And I use that when I stream live. Uh, I use that sometimes when I'm in a virtual meeting. I can change like, is it my MacBook camera or is it my Logitech camera or is my is my computer screen visible or not? I can just sort of easily change what somebody on the receiving end of the call can see. My middle row is a bunch of um, shortcuts. Now I have some shortcuts that I wrote that do things often in the studio. For example, when I record a podcast, I have a shortcut I run that like starts recording my mic, opens up my show notes, opens up all the apps I need, starts the Zoom call, and I have a one-touch button on my Stream Deck that'll do all of that for me. And I did that. The power is happening in the Apple Shortcuts app, but because the Stream Deck is able to be programmed to run a shortcut, that action has been basically just like reduced to a single always visible button on my desk. I have a similar one that puts me into lesson mode where all the stuff I need for lessons opens on my computer, where my iPad opens my sheet music and my student notes and my camera display, all of that fun stuff. I've also got some buttons that will do things with my door lock to the studio. I can unlock or lock the door. I can even check to make sure that a student has closed the door all the way. I'm in a sort of tree heavy area and like some critters have been found in our house. So I like to make sure that the sensor on the door is detected that they fully closed it when they have left. I've also got some buttons that trigger, they kind of act as a soundboard. So they trigger sound effects in the app Farago, which is a great soundboard app for the Mac. Things that are just fun to have one tap away, like for comical and engagement purposes and lessons. Like if a student does something that previously had seemed hard to them, I have a audio clip of somebody pressing the staples that was easy button followed by the that was easy voice. So I have that as a one touch button. I have the sound of Link opening a treasure chest in Zelda. Just just all sorts of little fun bits on there. Now I have next to that, the Ableton Push. I talked in the last episode how I'm using this to make play along material and to teach my private students how to properly practice things. So I'll refer you to that episode, episode 59, if you wanna go listen to that. Of course, I also use it for other production related purposes. It's a great device and it certainly does look pretty. To the right of that, I have a HomePod mini. Now I've got some home automation stuff down here, some lights, some locks, the doorbell. I've got some baseboard thermostats. They're all set up through Apple's HomeKit app. So I don't really listen to music on it because I've got really sweet studio monitors right above it, but it is like a Siri input for me. It's a way to talk to Siri and make the house do stuff for me. Next to that, I've got some pens. I keep about like 10 sharpened Dixon Ticonderoga pencils in a mug, as well as some Lamy Safari pens, which is like my venture into the world of pens. If you are a pen enthusiast, you will not think they are fancy, but by standards of like the average Bic pen that you find, you know, in the school supply aisle, they're, they feel really nice to write with. So I keep a couple of those nearby. I keep a notebook um, right next to me, you know, in that same area of the desk. And I just basically, uh, I'm a pretty digital guy when it comes to notes, but sometimes you just really need to be able to write some stuff down without fiddling with your computer. So I just have the notebook typically open to a blank page to begin uh, writing notes at a moment's notice. I've got this very mic I'm talking into also kind of clamped onto the desk. I really like my clamp. It is made by K&M. It's double braced and it's one of these things where like I can move the mic kind of anywhere and it'll just sort of hold its position. I'll link the one that I have in the notes to this episode. I'm pretty happy with it. And then I have a AKG microphone. It's the P420 and I like it. Now under this tier of the desk, there's some structures that where I can kind of like bolt in musical hardware. So like my audio interface is on a tray to my lower right, and I don't have a very fancy one. I just have the Scarlett 6i6, which this mic is plugged into, but I also have some MIDI devices plugged into it as well. It's got a second front facing input where I can plug an electric guitar or a keyboard or something else that I would want to record audio into a DAW with. Coming out of that is a pair of Audio-Technica headphones that are over 15 years old and falling apart. They were like 60 bucks. They don't make them anymore, um, but they're they're good. I like them. No complaints there. I'm not a super fussy headphone guy. And then, like I said, on this tray that sort of slides out, which is really designed for like a keyboard and mouse, I have a micro Korg on it, which is not a keyboard that I need to own, but it was at a time in my life when I needed a small MIDI keyboard. Someone was selling it to me for 
less than half the cost. And so I just sprung for it. It's synthesizer features are fun and serve me no real purpose other than just as a fun way to explore its many sound possibilities. But it's also plugged into my computer simultaneously as audio if I want to record any of those fun sounds, but also as a MIDI controller, which can, you know, be a real quick way to tap out a melody if I'm recording it into uh, Dorico as music notation. I actually, one of the issues with this as a MIDI controller is that when it comes to like playing software instruments into a DAW, the keys are like super tiny and unweighted. So it's like really not great for that. I kind of want to actually do get like a 66 key keyboard with some weight to it and some heft that does not occupy a ton of desk space, but something that where I could like be more performable. I don't know if anybody has a recommendation for me, like something like a, like a 40 to a 60 ish key keyboard with a good feel, maybe some drum pads and some knobs on top that I can use to automate my DAW. Like I, something, something like that, that it does not have a huge profile uh, and that'll take up minimal desk space. I'm, I'm really open to that. Okay. And then on the floor is like complete chaos cable management. I did recently get some tools that I'm going to use to kind of wrangle the situation. I will link those in the show notes and then maybe update you at a later time how it goes but currently chaos complete chaos i don't really want to talk about it i'm not a good influence in this way i do have a little kind of slide out soft bin it's sort of like something that i guess you would put underneath like a side table next to a couch throw blankets in or something but i just have like extra computer paper and some cables kind of hanging out in there i have a printer to my lower right corner which has been out of ink for over a year or two i think that printer ink is a scam and I'm going to try to avoid ever buying printer ink for it again. So I guess what I'm saying is I have a printer for sale if you want one. (laughs) Okay, to the right of that kind of in an L shape is this old Korg 88 key electric keyboard. It's from the 80s and it was like an upright piano. It was in a piano lab at a local high school in like back in 2002 or something. They were like getting new keyboards for this lab and like literally throwing some of them in the trash. So I was able to grab this one and throw it in my studio. The legs had already been sawed off and there's like no foot pedals, but some, there's something about the the style and the feeling of this kind of era of keyboard. Like the top of it is just like a, basically just like a flat plank of like wood painted black. So like it, it can, it's really easy to stack other keyboards or other devices or coffee or like paper on it's kind of like a table but that i can play and it's a great reference keyboard you know if you just because i have all this other stuff wired through midi and all that like it's just nice to be able to like poke something out on a keyboard without having to think about technology because the audio just comes straight through the speakers now my scale exercise play along tracks amongst other intonation related products i've made have usually been made using the next device I'm going to talk about. So if, you, or if you're into the idea of making play-along material for string, band, and choir students that has justly in tune intervals, drones, and melodies, um, this is a cool device. Certainly, it is not one that I recommend going and spending hundreds of dollars on when you could, fair, with fair ease, use something like the Tonal Energy Tuner app with like a small little Bluetooth keyboard. But this is on loan to me from one of our local high schools, and I've been using it to make some resources for my own students. And yeah, I mean, it's just a keyboard that, like I said, it can change its tuning system to various different major and minor keys, adjusting all the intervals uh, so that they are in accordance with just intonation. And I have that plugged into the audio input of my Scarlett 6i6. I've also got a Roland Octopad, which is just like a digital drum pad with eight playable pads on it. So I have it plugged in right now as a MIDI controller so that I can, if I need to record something into a DAW that requires rhythmic precision and I feel more comfortable with sticks, I can do it in that way. Okay, next up, let's talk about the desks that I work at at Ellicott Mills Middle School. There's more than one classroom space. So I wanna kind of focus this conversation around what's similar between the desks rather than what's different because I have, with my team, tried to make each desk have a really similar feeling to one another so that there is not a whole lot of customization that needs to be done. Now, the one exception to this is the front of the band and orchestra room, where we have quite a different setup. Now, there isn't really a desk in that room. There's a podium with, a, you know, one of those big, clear plastic music stands at the front. And then slightly, well, I should say like a hard right to the podium is a mixer that stands tall at a level where you can reach the sliders with your fingers. And plugged into this is a wireless Shure headset 
for being heard through the speakers in the room. Also, usually a phone and then my laptop are plugged into two other channels. So I can sort of balance the difference between any reference material I need to play on my computer or my phone and then also my voice. And I use a lot of play along tracks and we listen to a lot of music in class. So having that coming through the speakers in the room is super important, but also being able to balance it without leaving my position is really helpful. Now in between those sort of like diagonally to my upper right is actually a pearl percussion tray, like an auxiliary percussion tray, which we've propped up at a good height for typing. So, and it's height adjustable between the three different teachers who teach in that space. And on that is usually my phone, my laptop, any like pe like pencils, pens, like just stuff that I really need to have and reach without feeling like it's disrupting my teaching flow. And then that is going into the, we bought the same Thunderbolt hubs that I've been referring to them as docks in this episode. And I'm realizing that maybe a hub is a better term for this. Uh, we have the same 12 South hub and also a Scarlet, not the Scarlet 6i6, but a Scarlet Solo, which is just like a cheaper version of the 6i6 with only one input and output. We have we have that all hooked up to the front. So the computer only really requires one cable, but it plugs it into this hub, which into that hub is giving it both power, ethernet, connection to the projector at the front of the room, which is kind of positioned behind my head and up, and then also an output to the audio interface, which is going into the mixer. Now going into that interface is a microphone so that we can, on a whim, kind of record our ensemble with a higher degree of quality than you would into the voice memos app of your phone. Something I've blogged about before and spoken about before on the show is that I use my iPad Pro very differently in a band rehearsal than I do in other productivity contexts because it actually becomes a piece of paper, like a digital piece of paper for me there. I do not keep it docked on the keyboard. I take it off of the dock and I lay it flat on my music stand. And then on the left side of the screen, I have seating charts that I can annotate with the Apple Pencil, like Mark Who's Absent, scribble notes on top of kids' names. And then on the other side of the screen, I have the Fourscore app with all of my sheet music library managed. I also keep a copy of my daily lesson plan in a text editing app, which can be kind of slid over my other two apps. There's a feature on the iPad called Slide Over where you can get a, like an iPhone sized app that you can kind of like slide in from the side and then back off again. So I usually slide over my lesson plan, which is usually just in plain text written out for me for the day. And of course, all of this data syncs between my many devices. So when I am docked, at one of my desks with my MacBook, I can edit this stuff and set it up for the day, but then the iPad can view it all in this mobile form factor where it just like rests flush. And on my music stand, like a piece of paper where I can annotate it with the pencil or like pick it up and walk around the room, you name it. It's a, a big part of my workflow. In fact, I would argue that these days it is the only part of my workflow where the iPad is living its truth, so to speak, like being good at what it's best at, which is being a mobile touchscreen device that is of a particular size and shape. I would argue that the iPad Pro 12.9 inch is a little big to use in the earlier idea of an iPad where it's kind of like a, like a sit on the couch and read or like watch movies kind of a device, but it certainly does excel specifically in this musical and teaching environment. And I, you know, think that I will keep investing in that size of iPad and future iPad purchases for that very reason. Now what's cool about this setup is if I unplug my computer and then I go to either the general music room where I also teach, if I unplug my computer and then take it into the general music room, it's got that same hub. So just by plugging in one cable, I have my computer plugged in to the projector, it's getting power, it's getting internet, it's getting uh, an audio interface, all of that stuff which is really powerful. It just, it lessens the amount that I have to think about. It's, you know, my hardware, like I was saying at the beginning of this episode, I, I don't love buying hardware, fiddling with cables, ins and outs. It's not interesting to me and it's cumbersome. So what this effectively does is by having such a simple or rather consistent hardware setup on multiple desks with this USB hub, most of the setup technically that I'm doing is coming from like how I have set up my computer software itself, like how I've adjusted my Mac OS audio settings rather than how I've fiddled with the devices on my desk. So I kind of, when I make tweaks to like how loud something is or like how something is, where something is inputting or outputting, it's all happening through the software. The desks 
and the hardware on them sort of interprets those software settings in the same way. I've got that same hub on my office desk and that outputs to a monitor for viewing my work larger. I, I do a similar setup at my desk that I do in my home studio where I have my MacBook screen on the left, the monitor in the middle. I usually position my iPad Pro to the right. Uh, I have a little mini CME X key for doing MIDI note input that's sort of positioned in like right in front of the external monitor. It's also Bluetooth enabled. So if I unplug it, I can connect it to a device like my iPad and play the Drones of the Tonal Energy app or record as a software instrument or record a software instrument into an app like GarageBand. I've got a magic keyboard and mouse on that desk, just like I do in my home studio. I don't have a trackpad, but because that desk is all level and it's like shorter, I can reach the trackpad of my MacBook without stretching too far. So I kind of similarly have a trackpad available to my left. Now the least technological room I teach in is our stage. And on the stage, there's just a, a rolly cart and then a single lightning cable sort of hanging down from the ceiling that if I plug my phone in, allows me to play audio from my phone through the speakers. So I can play like music, I can play tuning drones, metronomes from my phone. I can like unplug the lightning adapter and then go like like eighth inch cable into my MacBook if I want and get my computer's audio. I typically don't. I really only teach up here when there is a conflict with the room. I usually teach my sectionals in the general music room, but because we have four teachers teaching in all these different rooms at once, sometimes, for example, like my, my, one of my colleagues will be teaching a general music class in the general music classroom on a period where I have sectionals. So I'll teach on the stage, or sometimes I teach on the stage because we have some extra percussion equipment up there. We share a band room with the orchestra, so the percussion players, like if they need to get on bass drums and xylophones and vibraphones and things like they can't do that in the band room because it's also the orchestra room so we've got some extra gear on stage so percussion sections take place up there i'm not there that often but i'm there often enough still like not enough for me to totally want to revamp the space it's kind of nice to just sort of disconnect and because my workflow is really um it's really mobile i can bring my ipad or my macbook up onto that stage and not really need all the extra hardware like i don't feel like it's holding me back from doing my best teaching so being able to just plug my phone in to the audio and get that has been a huge asset okay this week's app and tech tip of the week i'm just going to condense them into one and do two apps of the week because they kind of go together and they're inspired by some conversations i've had with other teaching colleagues of mine just about how like once the school year starts it can be so challenging to manage basic your basic personal life and specifically how meal planning can be something that really sets you up for success or really just makes you feel like you're totally failing and gasping for air at every point. So I wanted to talk about two apps that are essential to my workflow for planning food for myself. The first is called AnyList and it is a grocery list management app. Now you can just use the reminders app. I know a lot of people use like a checklist inside of a notes app, but what any list is really good at doing is when you add items, first of all, it has kind of a smart autocomplete about it. Like if you start typing the word blueberries, it'll like know you want blueberries and give you the option to quickly add that word. It also though categorizes all of your grocery list items by Cat, like by aisle, like what aisle or area of the store they'll be in. So it makes it a lot easier to shop. It's got a great watch app. For me, I'm like, my hands are usually full at the store. So I use the watch version of the app to check off my grocery items as I get them. And there's like a paid subscription that I am currently using because it allows me to sync multiple lists with my wife's phone. We also keep our travel list inside of it. Actually, this hints at one of the great features of the app is that for both a travel list and a grocery list, you might have a lot of repeat items and it has a really great feature where you just basically like uncheck a bunch of favorite items so that every time you replenish the list, certain items can automatically just like always be on your list. So like, for example, I always bring a phone charger everywhere I travel. So I don't have to like re-add that to my to-do list every time I travel, nor do I have to like uncheck everything from my previous trip. I just press a button in any list and then it brings back all those favorites that I use every time. So it's really great. It can look at websites that have recipes and parse out the ingredients and proportions and then automatically add them to your list. If you do use like an Amazon device or Siri 
for adding. Like if you're around the kitchen and you're like, hey, dingus, add eggs to my list. Well, it's actually able to pull from the reminders app. So like I have a reminders list called groceries so that when I tell Siri to add something to my groceries list, any list will go grab everything that's been added to that list and pull it into my own grocery shopping list. Similarly, Amazon devices can be used to add things because it's got a little integration with that. And uh, it's just in general, it's got a lot of other nice features like you can tell specific items like what store you buy them at, what quantity you have. You can take a picture of an item so that if someone else is shopping for a thing you like, they can like see a picture you've taken of the exact bag or box of that thing. It's just, it's a really nice tool. Now, the other app I like to use is called Mela. And Mela has some crossover with any list because any list can do recipe and meal planning. Like it can like put things on your calendar for you, including like an estimated time. It can actually parse the estimated cooking time out of blogs, like recipe blogs, and then add it to your calendar and all that stuff. But I actually uh, far prefer Mela for managing my re- recipes because it does it in a more elegant and intuitive way. So what you do is you share these online recipes to the app Mela, and then it is able to, similar to any list, parse out all that stuff. But then it's actually like a lot more legible and intuitive to read when you're in an actual cooking environment because it like blows up the text really big. It cuts out those opening paragraphs about like, my grandmother made me this pie every day when I was growing up and hanging out with her on her farm. Like it just, you know, it cuts all that, just gets straight to the ingredients, the proportions, the instructions, all blown up as big as possible on your iPad. It even has like, you can share your recipes with another person. So like my wife can add stuff from the web and it can even take the needed items and automatically add them to your shopping list, which if you have that set up as your like reminders list for groceries, then by chain connection, any list can actually go and look into those things added and pull them (laughs) into your any list. So I have sort of a chain reaction um, of, you know, I clip recipes into Mela, if I want to cook something, I save all the ingredients to reminders and then any list grabs them from reminders and like categorizes them by aisle and shares them with my wife. You get the idea. So it's really helped me a lot and I recommend it. For music of the week, I want to give a shout out to Evan Chapman, a past private student of mine. He has an excellent band called Square Peg Round Hole. They are a trio of percussionists who met at Indiana University and who write instrumental music that I guess could be considered post-rock. It's definitely, ha- it's interesting because, you know, they're dominant. The, the instruments they, they sort of tend to veer towards in the ensemble is Rhodes, keyboard, vibraphone, and drum set. But because they are out-of-the-box thinkers, they integrate lots of electronics and um, other auxiliary percussion instruments into their recordings, but also into their live sets. And I just really love that they're not making a style of music that you would typically expect from a percussion trio, but they are, they're making the the music that they like, that they hear in their head and have a vision for using the instruments that they have the highest degree of training in. And I love that they're not really seeing those two things as fitting into any kind of particular box, but rather just like, you know, using the tools that they've spent the time and the work training in to make the music that they want to make and not thinking really much about those limitations. So their new record is called Reservoir, and um, I'm really enjoying it so far. Today, I would like to introduce you to my Scale Exercise Play-Along Tracks with Trap Beats, available for sale at RobbieBurns.com. Trap Beat play-alongs include over 72 audio recordings, each of which includes a count-off, a trap beat at 70 beats per minute, and a tuning drone playing both the tonic and each note of the scale in just intonation, so your ensemble can learn to play in tune, develop steady, sustained tone, and blend with other sounds. These drones are stacked over top engaging trap beats that help students to practice at slower tempos while developing steadiness of time and a better concept of how the beat is subdivided. The scale exercises include whole notes, half notes, quarter notes, eighth notes, scale and thirds, and a mini scale with an arpeggio at the end in all 12 keys. 
I've also included three speed variations of a Remington exercise, so band ensembles can work on their favorite tone and technical exercises, whether they be from a method book or of your own invention. The tracks are $15, but for $40, you can get the stems to the tracks in Logic Pro and GarageBand format, so that you can do things like speed them up and slow them down, change the pitch, Add your own accompaniment. Take out my voice and add your own. And two, and three, and go. Or even sequence the tracks together to completely automate your ensemble warm-up. These tracks are perfect for running through your Google Meet, Zoom, or virtual teaching platform of choice. Or for running through the loudspeakers at the beginning of your in-person rehearsal. Check them out now at robbyburns.com slash store. I'm Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening to Music Ed Tech Talk. You can find the show's page, show notes for the episode, and my blog at musicedtechtalk.com. You can subscribe to blog posts through an RSS app of your choice, and you can subscribe to the podcast in the podcast app of your choice. You can now get blog posts delivered right into your email inbox once a week. Please rate and review this show in the podcast app. It absolutely helps. It'll take a second and just a few taps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word about it. Learn more about my music and teaching career at RobbieBurns.com. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube at Robbie Burns. Please consider supporting me on Patreon at Patreon.com slash Music Ed Tech Talk. All support tiers get perks, but even the base tier gets you access to the Music Ed Tech Talk Discord community, where you can chat with other supporters and guests of the show about music, apps, pedagogy, lesson ideas, tech support, and more. It's a fun place to be, and I hope to connect with you soon. Thanks to this week's sponsor, Scale Exercise Play Along Tracks. Be sure to check it out, and see you next time.